Christy Lopez, and I am professor of sociology. Um, and I also co-chair the Diversity Council Curriculum Committee with uh, my esteemed colleague, Dr. Steve Desai. I don't know if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, uh, Steve Desai, uh, associate professor in um, teacher education. And we have two amazing colleagues from the Division of Equity and Inclusion. I'll have Joanna introduce herself. Hi all, I'm Joanna Fernandes and um, administrative support for LGBTQ Resource Center and DEI. And Rodney. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Rodney Bow with the Division for Equity and Inclusion, director for the Men of Color Initiative and staff support uh, for the Diversity Council uh, Curriculum Committee. Thank you so much. So I'm gonna go ahead and share screen. We have a little PowerPoint should take about 15, maybe 20 minutes. And then the majority of the time is gonna be spent in dialogue with you. So um, we all just introduced ourselves. I do wanna um, start off with a UNM Indigenous Peoples Land and Territory Acknowledgement. And I don't know, um, Joanna, do you wanna read it? If you don't mind. Or you're actually um, letting people in. Rodney, thank you. Yes. UNM Indigenous Peoples Land and Territory Acknowledgement. Founded in 1889, the University of New Mexico sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia. The original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache, since time immemorial, have a deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land throughout the generations and also acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous peoples. We gratefully recognize our history. And this was developed by the Special Assistant for American Indian Affairs to the UNM president in consultation with the Native American Faculty Council and it was approved by President Garnet Stokes in February of 2020. Thank you so much, Rodney. So here's a little bio slide, just a little more on me. Most of my work does look at intersectionality, the importance of looking at the simultaneity of race, gender, class, and other axes of inequality. I um, have recently done work using a term I call street race that really gets us to think that race is not simply about your personal identity, but about how others see you. And, with Dr. Desai, I have the pleasure of working on a mixed method study that's funded by the WT Grant Foundation and the Hewlett Foundation that examines the role of ethnic studies, high school curriculum in reducing inequality and the centrality of culturally relevant pedagogy. Um, I am a Black Latina, US born, Dominican woman, um, whose parents never had the opportunity to have any formal education beyond you know, the second grade, but were rich in funds of knowledge and cultural wealth. And these are some of my books and work. And uh, Dr. Desai did introduce himself, but maybe he wants to add a little more. Uh, yeah, just uh, real quick, um, from New Jersey. Um, I was a former classroom teacher <clears throat> where I taught uh, elementary, middle, and high school. And then my areas of research is uh, YPAR, which is Youth Participatory Action Research, Juvenile Justice, and uh, ethnic studies. Thank you. And Rodney, do you want to add anything else? No, I've uh, been on campus for uh, over 25 years um, as a student and community advocate, and uh, I'm uh, involved in the, in the community and I'm loving working in DEI. And um, I also, um, I'm on the board for uh, the ACLU New Mexico, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference of New Mexico and the Outpost Performance Space. Thank you. And Joanna. Yeah, I'll just add that um, I am a professional experimental dance maker. I'm a graduate student um, in UNM's Department of Theater and Dance in, in their Dance History and Criticism Department. And my research is focused on marginalized independent dance artists in this era of US neoliberalism. Um, so I do that in addition to my, the work that I love as an administrative assistant with the Resource Center and DEI. Thank you so much. So I 
hope that this is really an invitation for a dialogue and it's interactive. So I'm gonna pose this question in, in the chat in a few words. Could you write, why is a diversity and inclusion curriculum important? Why does it matter? Why is it more important now than ever? And 20 years from now, how would we know that we've been successful in implementing a rigorous diversity and inclusion curriculum requirement here at UNM? So just take a few seconds um, as you um, jot down, I will continue sharing, but I do want you to think about um, why a diversity curriculum requirement is important as a requirement, not just an elective. So I will check in with you, but please write in the chat. Um, so we know that a curriculum, um, a diversity curriculum for our state is extremely important. You know, that the benefits of uh, diversity are not automatic. Simply living in a diverse state doesn't mean that um, you know everything about diversity, right? That we have to work in intentional ways and that curriculum and pedagogy matter. So the question that we must always ask is how does UNM, you know, preparing students for life, lifelong learning about our increasingly broadly diverse democracy in the US or global context? Um, this other slide comes from the UNM College of Education's um, five-year strategic plan um, of over a decade ago, but really points out that we have to acknowledge that power, social, economic, and political shapes curriculum, instruction, um, policy, and research in education. And again, another definition of uh, inclusion, which says, you know, on, ongoing intentional engagement with uh, diversity in terms of people and curriculum, the co-curriculum and communities, and, and how this is all a way of advancing empathy, right? And understanding um, so that we can work in, in community. So here is just a visual representation of um, all of our peer institutions, all of which had a diversity requirement before ours was approved in 2014. So just to say that we were just playing catch up with this um, US and global diversity requirement that we established in 2014. Another uh, thing to think about is that there is a causal link between diversity, equity, and inclusion curriculum and pedagogy and student success specifically and especially for underserved, but for all students. It improves critical thinking, it improves leadership skills, it creates proactive learning communities, and it really advances solidarity, deeper understanding of oneself, but also those that are different from you so that you can create bridges of understanding. It benefits all students, whether they're gonna be teachers, doctors, lawyers, artists, policymakers, future leaders of our nation, our state and the globe. So Arizona State, for instance, offers or requires nine credits, not only US, but also a dedicated course that addresses global diversity and cultural awareness. And so again, um, why the importance? So here's our definition of the US and global diversity and inclusion requirement is to promote a broad scale critical understanding of the cultural history and current circumstance of categories of people who've experienced historic or Con, um, contemporary and equitable treatment, whether that's in the United States or in the global context. And that the Diversity Council Curriculum Committee, which Dr. Desai and I co-chair, is responsible for reviewing the courses submitted um, for approval to meet this requirement. And it's important to note that for this committee, all appointed members have, have to demonstrate primary expertise in equity and inclusion. And that would mean peer reviewed scholarship, research, teaching and community engagement. And so um, it's incredibly important to recognize that uh, we are so grateful to all our committee members because they have a specific expertise in reviewing these syllabi. So the main criteria are that, they're not, that these courses are not merely describing diversity, but they are focused on analyzing power, whether that's systemic racism or colonialism or some other ism, ableism, um, patriarchy, some other system of inequality for an entire category of people. And we invite people to, to understand how all of those inequalities are con uh, connected. So you would also demonstrate that there is, that you're addressing one of those systems of inequality, but how it connects to others. Um, and you can specify, right? Um, if that's not uh, readily, 
uh, described there. Uh, Dr. Desai, did you want to um, jump in now? Is it a good time? Um, sure. Uh, but in the previous slide, it's like it's just important that um, can you just go back to the previous slide real quick? Sure. So it's just important, like the first three uh, that you see institutional colonialism and intersecting. Your course needs to um, focus on at least one of them, and then at least <clears throat> some of the care categories below on how you're addressing it. So we just want to make sure that's clear. Um, and then for student outcomes, the next slide. Um, the example I gave was uh, in education, right? Uh, one of the issues is, uh, let's say, special education. Um, so you can talk about like all the characteristics of what makes someone uh, eligible for being special ed. But the main difference, and that's just descriptive, right? You're just saying that there's an overrepresentation of BIPOC youth. There's an underrepresentation of BIPOC youth in gifted education. So you're just describing. But the real analytical stuff comes when you get into critical disability theory and how our society is set up in a way that doesn't really address um, people who have um, special needs. Another way is uh, talking about how there's a connection between students who happen to be in special education being overrepresented in the school to prison pipeline. Uh, so that's where we want you all to go and where we want you all to demonstrate in your courses. Yes, and just um, to circle back to the second learning outcome. So the first learning outcome clearly is about, it analyzes, not just describes um, inequity and issues of, of oppression, but the second one is that um, we need to understand how these dynamics impact and shape individual lives in, uh, and the larger social structures and communities, whether, again, that's racism, nativism, classism, and um, all of these other systems of oppression. Um, then another learning outcome is explain the critical literacy and ethics pertaining to the dynamics of diversity. And um, the fourth one would be the unequal treatment of social groups that are socially constructed and politically defined. When we first established the requirement, it was only um, required that you met one of the four learning outcomes. Um, then we moved up to two, now we're getting up to three. Eventually, we hope to, maybe by the time that we're 10 years old, make sure that if this is the one course that students are taking, that all of these learning outcomes are addressed in some way. So here's um, just a sampling of the types of courses that have met this requirement in the past. And you can see that everything from history to Africana studies, to language literacy and sociocultural, Spanish management, American studies, sociology, you name it. The point is that um, many disciplines have ways of addressing these learning outcomes. Um, so you can look at the expanded list if you go on our website. Um, so here's a little bit on the timeline. Um, we are having office hours and individual one-on-one -on -one consultations on Tuesdays from one to three, but that's not the only time. We can always schedule, you know, depending on our availability outside of that time. Just email US Global Diversity at UNM for an appointment and list at least three times that might work for you in 30 minute blocks, you know, for the, for the week or the following week. And then um, if you are submitting either a new course or you are actually in the process of submitting your updated syllabi for renewal, all of those will be due on September 24th, also by emailing globaldiversity at unm.edu. Um, all of this information is on our website, diverse.unm.edu. You'll see a tab that says diversity requirement and instructors, information for instructors. Um, so I also want to point out that if approved, uh, your course that is submitted now in the fall would appear a year later. After it leaves our committee, it has to be reviewed and approved by the Faculty Senate Curricula Committee. So um, it does take about a year 
And we welcome submissions at any time, but I just wanna make sure that everyone understands the timetable. Um, and again, it is true that, you know, in the spirit of continual improvement, we're asking everyone to submit an updated syllabi every six years so that um, we are continuing to always improve um, our, our uh, syllabi. Again, if you have any questions, email us and um, we will be happy to um, send you the checklist, which is available online on that website. Um, so uh, I'm getting towards the end because we definitely want to spend time answering questions. Here's just a little sampling of things that we think might let us know that we've been successful 10 years from now, that we see a connection, right, with this deep learning and student success, that we provide enhanced student work experiences, that um, we have a stable lo social location in the faculty senate governance structure, right, either as a subcommittee of the curricular committee, et cetera. So it has a life beyond you know, um, the division of equity and inclusion that is actually fully integrated into uh, faculty governance, that our statements for our missions, whether it's our department or the university reflect these goals, these learning goals and values that our public face does that, whether that's our website and that we see a culture shift. So th this is why this matters. So um, I have more slides that I can share with you, but I do wanna pause here and um, just take the opportunity to answer any questions that people might have um, and hopefully um, share any information you might have. There was a, and if, uh, yes, there's if a you joined late, I was just gonna write, remind everyone to put your name and email so we can stay in touch with you with any updates. Rodney, you were gonna say. Yeah, there's a question in the chat from Lisa. Um, how many uh, is that undergraduate uh, college of nursing courses have been approved since the inception of the committee? All of the approved courses are listed on our website and they're also on the gen ed website, but I don't recall very many, if any. And so that's something that we hope can um, change in the future. <laughs> so we welcome a syllabi. I use the example of the school of engineering. When we were starting this requirement in 20, 12, 2013, we found out there was this amazing course called uh, Women, Water, and Resources. It turns out it was a special topics, and that's something that I neglected to mention during the presentation. Special topics come and go. They also change in terms of content, so they are not eligible for review. Um, neither are graduate courses, because obviously, even though it's true that some undergrads can take graduate courses, the vast majority can't. You know, you have to get permission and all of that. So the reason why we don't want to make um, special topics courses eligible is that they may disappear. And the example I gave earlier actually did happen. Not only that, but those topics courses change. It might one year focus on the learning outcomes, but the next year it might not. So it is essential that any course that's submitted has a dedicated course number that remains stable, regardless of who the instructor is, right? The learning outcomes remain stable. So that's one thing I wanted to clarify. Also branch campuses teach many of the courses at the 100 and 200 level. So another course, uh, another question is, well, um, I teach at a branch campus. Do I have to submit my own, you know, um, syllabi? No, one syllabi is plenty. If in fact, for instance, sociology has a course called um, Dynamics of, of Prejudice, which is taught at many of the branch campuses and here on main campus, as long as that's already been approved, no one has to resubmit it. And if there's another course that for whatever reason is not taught here, absolutely submit it if it meets those learning outcomes. Preguntas, more questions. <laughs> Just to, uh, we met with folks in like, uh, I don't know if it was nursing, but um, other, um, health related courses. And one of the things we talked to those folks was uh, a lot of those courses did a great job of describing the issue, but not necessarily explaining why this issue occurs in, this, in the first place. So like, we all know uh, what is studies that shows that, you know, African-Americans, Native Americans, Asian Americans, Latino Americans, 
have higher rates of diabetes than uh, other groups. Like we know that there's a lot of health disparities that exist, but in order for that course to meet our requirement, you would have to start talking about like environmental justice, uh, health access, um, and other stuff. Like a great example would be the mortality rates with uh, women uh, giving birth. Like regardless of income or class, women of color face a higher um, risk when giving birth than other groups. So like that's where we want you all to go. There's a great film, and thank you, Dr. Desai, for that, called Unequal Treatment, that really does look at that. What's the structural origins of this high diabetes rate in communities of color, whether it's a Black Latino community, like the one I grew up in public housing in New York, or it's uh, an indigenous nation here. So looking at what, you know, is this genetic? I mean, one of the amazing things is that the American um, Medical Association just created a statement saying that they need to reform their curriculum to stop teaching the myth of racist biology and looking at the social construction of race and structural racism in creating the conditions that led to these disparities in health. So yes, there's that, that wonderful film called, um, un, um, gosh, did I just say the word unequal treatment? Unnatural causes. Unnatural causes, that's it. And you will see a very critical analysis of the social determinants of health. Um, that is not simply just descriptive. So thank you, Dr. Taylor. Other questions? Just doing my part to infiltrate and agitate because some of these nurses will become uh, nurse practitioners, midwives, faculty. Um, and if we don't set the tone early on that this is an expectation, it's not going to happen. And I'm one person with you know, some advocates because we have a diversity, equity, inclusion committee, but I'm just really intrigued about not only how do we do this at the undergraduate level, but push the envelope for our graduate courses as well. And that everyone should have to take your intersectionality course. Yes. Okay. I'm done now. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I don't want to be remiss and mention that there are um, ethnic studies programs, Africana studies, Native American studies, Chicano studies, women, st women, gender, and sexuality studies. So thinking about how many of these courses have been teaching these kinds of classes for a very long time, American studies, et cetera, and how there are certificates in each of those programs and also the Institute for the Study of Race and Social Justice that I co-direct that are interdisciplinary. So the idea that you can take an art class, a history class, and you know a biology class on anti-racism and biology and get a certificate transcripted for undergrad or grad and even community members saying you have in-depth expertise in these areas, it is a win-win for everyone. But I know there was another question. Yes, Dr. Gracia? Yes. Otaño Gracia. Otaño Gracia, thank you. Yes. <laughs> So I think it's a bit of a weird question and it, I, I imagine it's a no, but just something to, that I wanted uh, everyone to think about. So I am very committed to an anti-racist classroom, no matter what. And I'm also a medievalist. So I study texts from the eighth century to the 15th century and placed in Europe. So while I work and I strive very hard to, for all my courses to do all the things that, that you're saying, right? My courses focus on, on showing how the way that uh, academics discuss the Middle Ages is, is steeped in white supremacy and how it's being used to always show that how the West is better than other groups. My courses try to show how medieval texts show moments of you know, power imbalances and how that looks like. So this, it helps the students see power imbalances in, in the past, and then we apply it to the present. Um, and it also shows them how communities can happen and how, how communities defend themselves from oppression in the Middle Ages. So these are ways that I think my courses uh, fit the diversity. And, and I am very committed to this constant to do this. 
But any other medievalist that teaches my courses that is not committed to this does not have to do any of these things. So my course will fit this requirement, you know, whichever course I teach, but if this, another medievalist or another scholar teaches the same course and is not, does not have an anti-racist stance, he will not teach any of these things. So is there a way that I, as a committed anti-racist scholar, can have me be certified in a way? Like, like can I prove to you yes. every year and say, I can teach this course as the diversity course even though I don't necessarily want the course to be diversity because I am afraid that other people might not teach it in that way. Does, does that right. make sense? No, and it's it's a catch-22, right? Because of course there's plenty of courses, like I think about introduction to psychology or introduction to economics or intro to social, my own discipline. And depending on who the instructor is, there might be a very different content, pedagogy, learning outcome, even though technically. So the reason we hesitate to approve with a broad brush is that we are approving the course. We can't just approve an instructor, regrettably. I wish we could, but one workaround could be, I often cross list everything I teach with multiple programs because it meets the learning outcomes for women, gender and sexuality studies, because it meets the learning outcomes for um, public health or Africana or even uh, Chicano studies. So that's one workaround. It's not ideal because clearly the students registered under that credit would be getting credit because potentially, but the truth is that wouldn't even work because they, those are special topics. They're not, unless it's a dedicated course that says, you know, Chicano feminisms or um, the black woman and, and this course meets that criteria, then it, it would not. We do need to remain consistent in terms of making sure that it's a dedicated course. Because if it's a broad course taught by many people in many different ways, then we risk the possibility of approving a course blanket without ensuring the integrity that, of that, those learning outcomes. So I wish I could say yes, but you understand why we can't say no. I mean, we, we can't say yes. <laughs> so I apologize for that, but thank you for your work. I think that that's another strategy, right? that um, even though it might not technically register, but the reality is one course is not enough. <laughs> and we do wanna work our way towards um, increasing the number of courses, especially some that include a global context because we don't have too many of those at all. And certainly not a medieval um, reevaluation <laughs> of a structural power and, and exclusion. Other questions or thoughts? And I would invite Rodney or Joanna if, if you have anything else to share. Um, I know many of you already know um, some of the frequently asked questions that have come up. You've probably seen it in the chat or via our email. I would just say that one of the things that we we're looking for is for you to reach out to your colleagues as well and make them aware uh, um, that um, that this curriculum is much needed uh, for the University of New Mexico um, and get them to uh, to contact us uh, so we can help them to get their syllabi in. Um, and now there's a recording here that they can actually go back and review the information. Um, each year, uh, uh, Dr. Lopez uh, graciously puts up a recording and educates the campus on how to uh, get your diversity curriculum, uh, get your course uh, reviewed for, to, to be a part of the diversity curriculum. And so again, we ask that you reach out to your colleagues um, and have them to send in their syllabi for review. Thank you for that wonderful reminder. Yes, it takes a village, right? It's not just the committee. It's not just DEI, it takes you um, bringing this information, helping um, maybe new faculty don't know that their courses actually could meet the diversity requirement, or maybe um, a course has been relabeled and revamped. And now it really does make the diversity requirement. Um, maybe you can cross list your course with another department that may have similar learning outcomes as the ones that you're proposing. So there's a lot of creative ways. And, 
you know, think about how your um, academic program review, I don't know how many of you are um, at a point where one's gonna happen relatively soon. In my 20 years here at the university, I've had two, I think it was 2006 and 2016. So like every seven to 10 years, but to think about how that's an opportunity for critical reflexivity. What are our requirements and what are considered electives and how is diversity curriculum central or not? And um, yes, just an opportunity to continue improving our curriculum. So please, thank you Rodney for reminding us that it takes a village, a community of practice. It can't be just one solo instructor. Think about your um, institutional context, your departments, your programs. And at the graduate level, I mean, the other thing that we haven't talked about is if UNM did create one at the graduate level, we would be the first in the country that I'm aware of. And that would be a pretty amazing distinction. So I just wanna throw that idea out there. Other questions or comments, suggestions? Everyone knows when our office hours are, Tuesdays one to three, but again, we are happy to meet outside of those hours. We just wanna make sure we have some dedicated two hours and just email us three potential times in 30 minute blocks that might work for you. We'll confirm the time. And we're doing all our meetings via Zoom. It just makes it easier logistically. Plus I can't tell you um, in the last couple of weeks, many people I know colleagues all over the country are telling me that they have become ill with um, COVID, even after the vaccine, you know, because they, they were the early vac um, vaccinated. So we really do want to minimize if, if, you know, it means that we're going to avoid having a crowd with 20, 30 people. So, um, you know, we're doing everything in Zoom for now, but um, in the future, we do want to have like a, a working lunch and that kind of thing. I see another course, uh, a question from Dr. Taylor. Do you want to just speak it out? Yes, yeah, so um, thank you for the link from uh, Joanna. So I went in and looked going back to 2018 and I'm not seeing what? nurse courses. So I wasn't sure if that's because HSC is separate. No, um, we would so list it. Just, it would be in there. So I'm not seeing anything with NURS. And I know I have one colleague I had a conversation with that said she went through the process with y'all. So, um, and I have another colleague I'm gonna chat with when she comes back from leave, but I'm just not getting a sense from my colleagues that they're, they're going through this. And I would be on another tangent, I would be over the moon if there were a graduate, because that's what we're trying to do. We're in the midst of applying for a grant to do Jedi PAW with our graduate faculty. So it's kind of based on golden paw, but it looks a little different. And I think we've had some conversations with you about that. So I'm just, I'm, I know I'm new. I know I've been here for five minutes compared to other faculty, but I'm like, this just doesn't sit well with me. So I'm just going to take it upon myself to work with our DEI and move this forward because we need to see a whole lot more NURS classes on the list. So I'll share with you that sociology, for instance, just established a requirement that no one earns a graduate degree unless they've had a dedicated course that addresses these issues. So it can be done department by department, but hopefully college by college and maybe even university wide at the graduate level. Think about the value added for whatever profession our students enter in terms of having just one, <laughs> let alone the potential of doing a certificate, right? In, in one of these areas, what transformational um, work can happen with these insights. Um, so it, it is one day at a time and thank you for bringing that up. But no, I wanna reiterate, there is no separate process for HS, uh, HSC for the Health Sciences Campus. Um, I thought I had seen one or two, but for whatever reason, they're not on the list and, and we need to figure out what happened in that case. Maybe it's a resubmission, maybe it's um, something that's in the works, um, but we absolutely want more classes from every single discipline. There should be. Well, also, Dr. Lopez. Go, go ahead. Yes, uh, Dr. Royball, do you wanna yes. just? Well, thank you so much, Dr. Taylor, for mentioning uh, that important uh, 
topic. I think it's about awareness and continuing to reach out to our colleges and schools uh, throughout the University of New Mexico. I recall when you had mentioned this before during our diversity curriculum committee meeting, Laura Valdez had mentioned a particular nursing class that she recalled has been successful in going through the process. So there should be at least one, right, Laura Valdez? Is yes, Laura thank Valdez you, Lawrence. Back? I'm sorry, so sorry. Uh, I'm so sorry. Yes, thank you, Lawrence. I just posted on the chat the one course, nursing course, the NIMNIC uh, course. It's a healthcare participant. So I think Rodney and I can do some follow up to see where it it got, why it's not on the list. Yes. So thanks for I thought I remembered me. that. So maybe there, there was some error there. So thank you for looking into that and we'll follow up. Make sure there's at least one, but we expect more. And then the second topic I wanted to raise is when we mentioned the strategic plan for the University of New Mexico 2020, I know the committee is already meeting to uh, establish the 24 strategic plan. And we're very fortunate that UNM Diversity Council members sit on that committee, but uh, thinking about how we continue to keep this important uh, topic on that agenda as well. Thank you. Thank you for that reminder. And, and again, um, a lot of um, change can happen at the department level too. So always like thinking university and department because it has to be both and. So I, um, Congratulate you for doing the work that you do, because it's hard, it's hard. I wanted to remind everyone too, again, that um, if you have a course that needs to be renewed or you're looking at submitting a new course, that the deadline uh, is September the 24th, that's coming up. And we'll help you to, uh, to get those papers in, to get the, to get the syllabi in and, and to do the checklist. Um, and it, the process, it's not gonna be immediate, it takes a year, it has to go through faculty senate. So um, again, reach out to your colleagues. I'm sure you can think of a colleague or two that their course might fit into the diversity curriculum uh, uh, requirements. And so we're asking you again to, to uh, help us to uh, build the diversity uh, curriculum. It's, it's really important that we all participate in building of the diversity curriculum for the for the University of New Mexico and our students. So and again, that, September the 24th. And one thing I wanted to also mention is that we're in the process of establishing uh, an ethnography of UNM project. And part of that will be archiving all of our syllabi for posterity. So uh, 50 years from now, when we're not here, <laughs> someone can go back and say, oh, look at what they were teaching in you know, communication and journalism or in art history or a dance, or maybe it's in um, psychology or nursing. So, and that's optional. No one has to submit their syllabi for the archive, but we would invite anyone who would like to volunteer their syllabi. And you could even say, I wanna make it available in 10 years or in 20 years, whenever you can designate when you want it released, but at least it'll be there for posterity to kind of create a genealogy. As you could imagine, we're continually improving. I don't know what this is gonna look like in 20 years, but there will be a, a, a footprint. <laughs> and um, Joanna, I don't know if you wanted to mention a little bit about the process for the Ethnography of UNM project, how we're archiving already other materials, videos and things like that. Yeah, well, we're just in the beginning processes, processes of um, working with the digital repository, which I think is gonna be terrific. And so, um, yeah, we're going to be gathering all the information and then putting it up, making it accessible um, on the repository, not just for UNM, but for people across the globe, really. Anybody can, depending on the um, criteria that we put in, most people will be able to look at what we're doing, look at the syllabi. Um, so I think that's pretty exciting. And we'll, and we'll, it remains to be seen, right, Nancy, what um, the extent of the materials that we'll put up, but it could be videos, workshops, et cetera, as well. Syllabi. Most departments already have their own archive, and I would say most of it is probably not digital. I remember there was a time where there was just this huge draw in my department with every single syllabi for every course we've taught. But eventually, um, I'm assuming some departments might also do the same kind of thing. 
but we want to have one that's dedicated to the um, diversity, equity, and inclusion requirement. And again, as I said, it would be an opt-in. No one is required to um, submit their syllabi, but it would be a wonderful way of saving um, some information for posterity. I know that we're coming up on our time. We still have about seven to eight minutes. Other questions, suggestions, or um, thoughts that you had. We neglected to mention that we do meet as a committee once a month at least. And we have um, a meeting. I want to say, Rodney, do you recall um, when our next meeting will be? I believe it is on the 21st of September. Let me check really quick to make sure. We have it posted. I just cannot remember the exact date. But if, if you ever want to come, everyone's welcome. You know, um, so just shoot us an email. We'll send you the Zoom link. And I know many of you attend, so it's great. Well, unless anybody has any other questions, reach out. Um, we're here. We can meet tomorrow. Like you can send an email today and tomorrow between one and three for sure we're available. But like I said, if it's going to be Thursday at two, if we are available, we'll make ourselves available. Just send us three options so that we have a little window. Thank you so much for being here and feel free to reach out anytime. Gracias.